The wind, for a few days following my escape from the pirates, blew a steady but moderate gale, and the sea, though agitated into long rollers, was not uncomfortably rough or dangerous. And while sitting in my cabin, I could hardly realize that any sea was running at all, so easy was the long, swinging motion of the sloop over the waves. All distracting uneasiness and excitement being now over, I was once more alone with myself in the realization that I was on the mighty sea and in the hands of the elements. But I was happy, and was becoming more and more interested in the voyage. Columbus in the Santa Maria, sailing these seas more than four hundred years before, was not so happy as I, nor so sure of success in what he had undertaken. His first troubles at sea had already begun. His crew had managed, by foul play or otherwise, to break the ship's rudder, while running before probably just such a gale as the spray had passed through and there was dissension on the Santa Maria, something that was unknown on the spray. After three days of squalls and shifting winds, I threw myself down to rest and sleep, while with helm lashed the sloop sailed steadily on her course. September 1 in the early morning, land clouds rising ahead told of the Canary Islands not far away. A change in the weather came next day. Storm clouds stretched their arms across the sky. From the east, to all appearances, might come a fierce harmattan, or from the south might come the fierce hurricane. Every point of the compass threatened a wild storm. My attention was turned to reefing sails, and no time was to be lost over it either, for the sea in a moment was confusion itself, and I was glad to head the sloop three points or more away from her true course, that she might ride safely over the waves. I was now scudding her for the channel between Africa and the island of Fuerteventura, the easternmost of the Canary Islands, for which I was on the lookout. At 2 p.m., the weather becoming suddenly fine, the island stood in view already abeam to starboard, and not more than seven miles off. Fuerteventura is 2,700 feet high, and in fine weather is visible many leagues away. The wind freshened in the night, and the spray had a fine run through the channel. By daylight, September 3, she was 25 miles clear of all the islands, when a calm ensued, which was the precursor of another gale of wind that soon came on, bringing with it dust from the African shore. It howled dismally while it lasted, and though it was not the season of the Harmattan, the sea in the course of an hour was discoloured with a reddish-brown dust. The air remained thick with flying dust all the afternoon, but the wind, veering northwest at night, swept it back to land, and afforded the spray once more a clear sky. Her mass now bent under a strong, steady pressure, and her bellying sail swept the sea as she rolled scuppers under, curtsying to the waves. These rolling waves thrilled me as they tossed my ship, passing quickly under her keel. This was grand sailing. September 4, the wind, still fresh, blew from the north-northeast, and the sea surged along with the sloop. About noon, a steamship, a bullock droger, from the river plate, hove in sight, steering northeast and making bad weather of it. I signalled her, but got no answer. She was plunging into the head sea, and rolling in a most astonishing manner, and from the way she yawed, 
one might have said that a wild steer was at the helm. On the morning of September 6, I found three flying fish on deck, and a fourth one down the fore scuttle, as close as possible to the frying pan. It was the best haul yet, and afforded me a sumptuous breakfast and dinner. The spray had now settled down to the trade winds and to the business of her voyage. Later in the day, another droger hove in sight, rolling as badly as her predecessor. I threw out no flag to this one, but got the worst of it for passing under her lee. She was indeed a stale one. And the poor cattle, how they bellowed. The time was when ships passing one another at sea backed their topsails and had a gam, and on parting fired guns. But those good old days have gone. People have hardly time nowadays to speak even on the broad ocean, where news is news, and as for a salute of guns, they cannot afford the powder. There are no poetry enshrined freighters on the sea now. It is a prosy life when we have no time to bid one another good morning. My ship, running now in the full swing of the trades, left me days to myself for rest and recuperation. I employed the time in reading and writing, or in whatever I found to do about the rigging and the sails, to keep them all in order. The cooking was always done quickly, and was a small matter, as the bill of fare consisted mostly of flying fish, hot biscuits and butter, potatoes, coffee and cream, dishes readily prepared. On September 10, the spray passed the island of San Antonio, the northwesternmost of the Cape Verdes, close aboard. The landfall was wonderfully true, considering that no observations for longitude had been made. The wind, northeast as the sloop drew by the island, was very squally, but I reefed her sails snug and steered broad from the highland of blustering San Antonio. Then, leaving the Cape Verde Islands out of sight astern, I found myself once more sailing a lonely sea, and in a solitude supreme all around. When I slept, I dreamed that I was alone. This feeling never left me, but sleeping or waking, I seemed always to know the position of the sloop, and I saw my vessel moving across the chart, which became a picture before me.